Okay, it's great to see you all again. Um, we are going to dive into systems. I want to say something really clearly though. Often we think about learning and then over here we think about systems and leadership. Don't let your brain do that today, okay? We're going to bring what we thought about with learning and what we the amazing last hour and a half that was also about learning and the work of teaching into how we think about systems. They cannot be separate if we want that kind of learning to happen and the kind of change and, and different storylines to unfold for our kiddos, okay? So bring what we learned about learning and the things we're unlearning about learning into how we think about systems. And I'm not going to give you any recipes or quick tips. That is not what this is about. It's about how do we think about our systems. And I actually just revised this because I want to bring a thread through from this morning into how we're thinking about systems. So later today, I'm going to be think, talking a lot about thinking traps. These are habitual ways of thinking about the work that we do, that we do without even thinking about it. They're what we fall into. Here's one of the key thinking traps I think has kept us from making the math change that they were talking about this morning for decades and decades. Oh, no, this isn't working. There we go. This is a trap. Many of the efforts to change math teaching and learning have focused on kids. If we continue to just focus on kids and see this as a kids challenge, or about the challenges in their communities that create challenges for them in the classroom, if we see it through that lens, then the change is still not going to happen. This is a systems change and adult learning challenge that we have to grapple with together. So bringing forward, wow, it really isn't working. Bringing forward what Maisie and Deborah were talking about. As leaders, we are also authors of storylines. Our systems author stories, our leadership moves offer, offer stories. So keep in your head today as we're talking about systems, what storylines are we recreating for our educators? And how can we author different storylines? Because if we want different storylines for kids, we actually have to create different storylines in our school systems first. And related to that, this was, I just typed this sentence as they had it up on their slide. We have ways we do things in school systems. Those ways we always do things, those roles we always have, are not going to create different math classrooms. So part of what we were doing yesterday was seeing the assumptions we bring forward about learning that aren't very useful. Now we want to see the assumptions we bring forward about systems and supporting learning that are also not useful. That's the work today. Okay. Well, I guess I'm going to be over here today. Okay. So again, what storylines are being produced in this moment as a leader? And as leaders, we create storylines about a lot of different individuals and groups. Okay, and what are the things we're doing that animate those storylines? The little moves we make, the big thing, decisions we make about systems, what a PD looks like, all of those create storylines about these different individuals and groups that shape what ends up happening for kiddos. So often when I work with pre-service teachers, one of the big messages I try to have them walk away with, if anything, is that every single thing they do sends a message about who kids are, what learning is, what math is, every single thing you do. That was key in those videos we just saw, right? It wasn't about whether morning meeting was happening, it was the little tiny moves within morning meeting that sent these messages. If you walk away with one thing from these two days, maybe it's that everything we do as a systems leader also sends these messages. What you make PD look like, what you expect the principal role to be like, what you give feedback to principals about, 
what you choose to present about, the language that comes out of your mouth, right? All of those send messages about what equity is, what schools are, what learning is, what math is, what you're hoping your teachers engage in. So let's bring those ideas forward with us as we think about and kind of reimagine what our systems could look like. Okay, so here we are in designing educator learning systems. After lunch, we'll bring that together with thinking about organizational practices. And again, I am scratching the surface here and it's really hard for me. <laughs> I would love to spend hours on all of this with you all, but see it as nuggets of conversations you can keep having as your team. So here's some stuff that we worked on yesterday. Here's some ideas I saw across the posters. We are thinking about learners. And here I'm putting learners, that means anyone. Kids, teachers, educators, leaders. And I'm hoping you notice some connections when Maisie and Deborah were talking. These are storylines, right? What storylines do we want to create for learners? What do we want learners' storylines to be? And that fits into this becoming piece of learning that we can't ignore. And the challenge is when we plan PD, if we think now about our adult learners, we tend to think in little bite-sized pieces, right? What's my goal for tomorrow's hour? Guess what? Becoming doesn't happen in an hour. So it forces us to change our thinking in terms of thinking long-term about what our goals are for our, our educators, okay? This was another thing that seemed to really resonate with people we have to see everyone on a messy trajectory. Okay, so here we are, we're diving into what supports learning and if you haven't noticed, I've made a shift here. We're now thinking about every learner in our system. I hope that we're walking away noticing where there's disconnects and starting to think about how we think about all learners in the same way. So just like yesterday, I'm gonna have you do some independent reflecting first, and then we're gonna to come together as a group. So find a piece of paper. And here's the T chart, or on your computer, we're gonna work with for a little bit here. One side is gonna be what does support learning, and one side is going to be what does not support learning, but often happens. And again, when you see this word learning, I want you to think about how we thought about learning yesterday. And first, just jot down for yourself whatever comes to mind. What supports children's learning? And what does not support children's learning but often happens? So just jot down whatever comes to mind. Take about 10 more seconds for children. Again, it's just a little brain dump to start us out. What does support their learning? What often happens, but we know from experience, does not actually support learning. Okay, go ahead and draw a line across your T-chart underneath where you're writing, to create a different section. And now I want you to do the same thing, but for teacher learning. We think about teachers, what does support learning? What often happens, but does not support their learning?
what else would you add? Ten more seconds for teachers. Again, we're just brain dumping here. Okay, go ahead and draw another line. Now let's think about school leader learning. One more line, one last section here. District or regional leader learning. Okay, so, oops, now what we're gonna do in groups is think across all these learners. And we're gonna try to make a collection across learners of ideas about what does support learning and what does not support learning, but often happens. So, I think most people should have poster paper, and if you don't, there's more up here or more back with Trish and Rusty, or if your group feels like you just want to write it on a piece of paper, that's also fine too. But let's pull our ideas together and see if you can walk away today with a little initial list of what does support learning and what does not support learning. Let's do it. Okay, I'm actually going to pause your conversations. Okay, it's okay if you didn't capture all of your ideas. You're going to have chances to dip back into this poster in a minute. What we're going to do now is add to our thinking. I'm going to put in front of us some, some thinking tools that I find useful in this. So the first one is going to be thinking traps, which I previewed a little bit and then we'll move into some design principles. Thinking traps, as I said before, I'm thinking about these as habitual ways of thinking about learning and educational change that we can and often do fall into, but are not effective. And I think what you're gonna see about these is they are very built into our systems. They are the way things are done and we don't even see them often. 
So here's the first one. We talked about this a little bit yesterday, right? Once you start looking for this one, you see it everywhere. Here's another one. So this connects to the first one in that I see a problem. I see, teacher, that you are not leading discussions. Or I see, teacher, that you tend to have a deficit perspective about kids. So I'm going to um, fill your deficit. I'm going to fix it. And now you're better. Or principal, you're not completing your evaluations on time. I'm going to fill this deficit that you have. And now you're better. Kid, you don't know your five times tables or you don't know how to count by twos, I'm going to give you a support so that you fix that and you know how to do it. Here's another one. OK. The answer is, we need math coaches. The answer is, we need to do lesson study. Any of those can be incredibly powerful, but as I'm hoping you're starting to pick up on, it's how it's done and how it's built into the system. Just saying the answer is this, let's do it, without thinking about how it's going to be done and how it's going to fit into your system and what learning is necessary means we're falling into the trap. Another one we see across the system. If you've been something, then you know how to support someone else to do it. If you've been a teacher, you are ready to be a coach. And you're definitely ready to be a principal. And if you are a principal, then you're definitely ready to be a district leader. OK, so the trap here is not seeing the learning demands that are built into these different roles. Again. If we don't think about the learning that needs to happen across the adults in a system, then kids' learning is not going to change. So here's four thinking traps that I see as really tied into this one image that we looked at yesterday, right? This conception of learning, that if I, you don't have it, I give you the magical thing, and then you have it. We see that, as I'm hoping you're seeing, across kids, teachers, instructional leaders, district leaders, state leaders. We see it across the spectrum, right? OK, two other thinking traps I want to put in front of us. As a teacher, equity PD for me was always separate than my math PD. In the teacher education program I worked in, you had your culturally responsive teaching class, you had your math class, you had your literacy class. Okay, so I'm learning about being a culturally responsive teacher kind of generally. But I'm not learning anything about what that means, about how I need to show up in the classroom when I'm teaching math. And I'm not learning anything about how it's specified to mathematics, how oppression and injustice show up in the practice of mathematics specifically. I'm not learning anything about that. So a trap we fall into is keeping them separate. That doesn't create change. Okay. So here's, I've put in front of you six traps. We're going to take a couple minutes, look at your poster. Where do you see these traps already? And what do you want to add to your poster?
Okay, I'm going to pause your conversations again. Okay. I did hear one thing that's an important thing to add here. This one about the answer is, can also be insert curriculum. I heard Jill. Uh, that's an important one that we often do. Oh, if we just get the right tool for teachers, then everything will transform. What I hope you're starting to think about is how it doesn't really matter what the curriculum is if you haven't built the teacher learning around it, and if you haven't built the leader learning around it, and you haven't built the system around it. You can implement any curriculum in a way that act either perpetuates these storylines that we don't want for kids, or creates opportunities for new ones. Okay. So that was thinking traps. Those are the things we can fall into, the things hopefully we're trying to move away from. I don't know why this isn't working today. Now we're going to think about some principles, and I want to be really clear here. Just like Maisie and Deborah were talking about with the essentials and the values, these are things we have to bring to life in order for them to have any meaning. So let's think about how we might bring them to life, not just talk about them. So the first one is transformational learning is supported over time through intentionally redesigned systems, communities, and relationships. So I'm going to dive into this a little bit. Oops. So often we just think about events or we think about a tool we might give people. What I'm going to encourage you to think about is how we need to think about roles, we need to think about events, routines, and tools. So roles, it might be a new role we need, or a completely reimagined role that we need. Events include both intentional and incidental events. So if we think about our classroom videos, morning meeting is an intentional event. The incidental interactions that happen within morning meeting are the incidental events, right? So they can also be discrete or they can be ongoing. So we use events to capture a lot of different grain sizes here, okay? If we think about um, a kid, so we can think about kids in creating their storylines in classrooms from this morning, right? In order to create a different storyline, we need to reimagine the role of the teacher, we need to reimagine the role of instructional leaders. We need to think about both the intentional lessons and the structure of those lessons and the things we're putting in front of them, right? And what are those incidental little tiny interactions going to look like? We cannot just think about what's the structure of the math block, check. We have to think about the tiny events within that. Then we have to think about the tools we're giving them. Are we giving them packets? Are we giving them Legos to play with, right? Those things matter. And then we need to think about the kinds of routines that are happening. So these are the predictable sequences of events and interactions that happen over and over. How does someone respond when a kid has an answer that's not what you were expecting? What happens when another kid yells something out at that kid? Right? We saw some examples of different ways that can go. Those are routines. Oops. Okay, if we think about teachers, that means you have to reimagine the role of the principal and the instructional coach and probably district leadership around that in order for that to happen, right? We might be thinking about the kinds of sessions we're designing for teachers and also what are the incidental interactions that are happening throughout my day, right? If I have a hard time, can I go and talk to a colleague about something that was really challenging or does that not feel safe? Those are incidental events that are gonna shape how I learn. The tools I get do matter, but they're just part of the part of the puzzle. I 
And then there's routine. So one example of a routine that I encourage you to think about, and I experience as a teacher, is this idea of teacher timeout. This is a teacher learning routine, where as I'm teaching with colleagues, I'm in a room with colleagues, I can pause and we can puzzle through instruction together. So think about what that routine, being able to pause and say, huh, I'm not sure how to move forward and, and support kids thinking in this moment. Or do you think we should ask this question or this question? How does that transform my storyline as a teacher? This whole co collection of things is what creates a different kind of learning experience for teachers. And now here's what I want to emphasize. If we think about storylines, if we think about kiddos, this is kind of like what Maisie and <laughs> Deborah put up, right? Each interaction or each PD, how often do we think about it in terms of what people are experiencing across a year or multiple years? This is the difference between the teacher who picks up the curriculum guide every day and says, okay, what am I teaching today? And puts it back down versus the teacher who's like, okay, I'm working towards this at the end of the year or I want my kids to be like this in fifth grade or as high school learners. So this is how I'm thinking about this lesson today. So as a teacher, my learning is supported by all of these things and how they interact over the course of my entire career, but also the course of my school year, the course of my week. These are shaping who I think I am as a teacher, what I know as a teacher, what I think is important as a teacher. Here's what's crucial though. Just like in classrooms, the context I'm in matters. So as a kid in a classroom, it doesn't really matter what the discussion routine is or how great the teacher's moves are if the community doesn't feel like a place where I feel valued or where I have relationships. So as a teacher or any educator, if I don't feel like I can take risks and experiment, if I don't feel like I'm engaged in reflective dialogue with colleagues, if I don't feel like I can deprivatize my practice and talk to you about what's going on in my classroom or in my school and what's hard and what's tricky and what's just overwhelming me, or what's going amazingly and how brilliant my students are, right? The whole spectrum, then it's not gonna matter as much what's happening in those events. So that's the first design principle. This is the second one. So this is the counter to if I tell you it or show you it, then you'll know. Okay? This is what we're trying to get in classrooms where instead of me telling you how to multiply fractions, I'm gonna give you some experiences that support you to make sense of what it even means to multiply a fraction and come up with your own strategies that work really well and guess what, you're not gonna mess them up every time because it makes sense to you. Okay, so if we um, put our, our if we, we think about the last two days, there's been some, moments where I was attempting to make that move in our learning, right? I could have told you all of this information. I've tried it as many moments as possible, and Maisie and Deborah did too, right? Like, what was your experience like? What was your storyline? What has your PD been like? Or just now we did, based on your own experience, what supports learning? Because a lot of this, just like our kids have brilliant math ideas, if we give them opportunities to, to share them and engage in them, we also actually know what's gonna support our learning. We know what we want our school systems to feel like, but we often are just given solutions rather than giving access to really reflect on them and think about them. Okay? And here's the last one for right now.
So this is something else I've been trying to do, and we saw a beautiful example of Maisie and Deborah doing this also. We have to intentionally disrupt what we're trying to move away from. We have to say it, and then we have to show it. So we have to ex uh, unpack what are the narratives and storylines that kids do end up having. We have to name those, and then we have to start to co-construct an idea of what we want to move towards instead. So here's an example from when I was a teacher. We often have norms, right? We've had norms the last few days. These are pretty common norms. At the school I was at from day one of our attempt to transform mathematics instruction, these were two other norms that were always on the list. Now, I want to name, just like classroom norms, it means nothing if it's just on the paper, right? My leaders did amazing things on a day-to-day -day basis and a moment-to-moment -moment basis to bring these norms to life. And as a community of teachers, we brought them to life too. But what does it do if we say them explicitly up front? And what do they do together, right? We're going to try to work together to interrupt deficit perspectives. And we're also going to be OK with being messy and collaborative about that. Again, you have to bring these to life. These are counter normative in schools. We do not call each other out on things. We have cultures of niceness, right? But by naming these up front, by having them on the piece of paper or the slide that we saw every single time we were together as teachers, they were starting to name the things that needed to be disrupted. We've been doing this today too, right? I put up the thinking traps. Those are the, I'm stating explicitly, these don't work, let's move away from them. Here's another example. This is something the principal at that school said. I'm not putting this forth as a script. But what does it do for me as a teacher if my principal says this? And then key, she didn't just say it one time, right? And she didn't say it, and then every time she saw me ask me about my test scores, right? She, she brought it to life. She never once asked me about my test scores. She came into my classroom and thought with me about what my kids were doing and their brilliant ideas, right? She asked me to send kids to her office if they had a brilliant math strategy so that she could see it. Okay? When, I, when she came in and I said, well, this is a story she liked to tell, she would come into classrooms and teachers, the kids would be working on stuff together, and teachers would say, oh, I wish you came in here when I was teaching. And she would say explicitly to them, that's not teaching. When you're talking to them, that's not when you're teaching. OK, so that's her explicitly disrupting the narrative. So we need to think about the places in our learning systems where we are explicitly stating what we're moving away from, and especially the ones that are the ones that perpetuate the inequity and the oppression in our systems, right? The power of test scores to keep instruction the way it's been. If we don't disrupt this, actually, then a lot of the other stuff we're trying to do isn't going to do very much. OK. Take a moment, or take a few minutes right now, and then we'll come back to this after lunch. What new ideas does this give you for your poster? Where do you see these ideas on your poster? Try to capture some thinking.
whether you can put them at the bottom of the bag. You ready? Okay. I'm going to pause you because it's lunchtime. Okay. <laughs> All right. We definitely scratched the surface on this one. I'm hoping it uh, gave you some new ideas about what you want to move away from and towards. I want to name this is really very, very challenging. And just like we were saying earlier, that there's no clear answers. There's no recipe we can give you. We have to imagine this. We don't know everything about how to create these systems. And each system you create is probably going to be a little bit different because you're different contexts with different people. So there's no recipe, but we know the underlying principles of what does not work, and we have ideas about the underlying principles and the underlying values about what could work. And so if we can move towards what could work, and those values that, that we think could support actual transformation and how adults are so showing up in our systems and creating our systems and supporting our classrooms, that's, that's the next step forward in my mind. So we'll dive back into that a little further after lunch, and Trisha's gonna tell you about lunch. Sure.